Hello everyone, this is Shane Gibson with Racken, and please do not adjust your set. Yes, I am sideways today. I'm having a big of a fail with my cameras here, so we're gonna stick with it for now as something a little bit of different, and maybe we'll uh, keep your attention for the uh, next hour or so. Thank you everyone for joining. Today we have a guest presenter. We have Bastian, who will be presenting to us some Alpine Linux uh, content and uh, interesting things he's been doing with digital uh, provision in Alpine Linux. As always, we've got the rack end crew, Rob Hirschfeld, Greg Althaus, and Victor Lowther on board with us. Uh, and so today's agenda, we're gonna talk about Alpine Linux. Uh, Rob and Greg will be talking a little bit about the uh, rack and content catalog. It's gone through some generational changes here in the last uh, month or two as we've developed it. And there's some really interesting, cool automation infrastructure as code things that we can help apply with that. And if you're not sick of looking at me sideways yet, uh, we'll come back to me sideways, but in the meantime, let's pass things over to Bastian. And Bastian will let you drive uh, the presentation from here and talk to us about <laughs> what you're doing with Alpine Linux and show us what's going on. Okay, <clears throat> thanks for having me, guys. Uh, so, welcome, Bram, last minute. <laughs> <laughs> So this is the first time I'm doing this Zoom stuff. So let me see how I can share some stuff. We will be grading you afterwards, Bastian. Okay, no problem. I'm used to that. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all visible, right? Yep, we can see that. Okay, I can cool. see that at least. Yeah. So um, and, and it's right side up. So good job on that. That's that's also very nice, I guess. Yeah. Otherwise, I see all the people sitting like this on the <laughs> on the camera. So uh, well, thanks again. Um, uh, I have a couple of slides just to set the stage a bit uh, about what we have been doing and uh, what are our, uh, our ideas and uh, why why we think. Uh, DR provision is an excellent fit for what we're trying to achieve. So um, a little bit about me, I'm a freelance DevOps consultant. Uh, I do a lot of CI, CD and provisioning and um, self-healing infrastructure stuff for clients. I currently work at NADOP. Uh, maybe you saw the little logo on the bottom of the screen. Uh, so NADOP is a, a, a big IT and IoT uh, kind of company I guess uh, they work in a lot of areas and currently I'm working with a team that does a lot of uh, R&D stuff and trying to figure out uh, how to do things uh, in a new and innovative way uh, and do it a bit more future-proof so um, that's a, a bit of the, the context uh, so I want to tell you a little bit about what we were uh, trying to do with Alpine. Uh, so let me see. Yay. So uh, to set the stage, uh, I guess most of you guys already know this, but uh, maybe for some people that are watching uh, this recording on YouTube. Uh, so what is immutable infrastructure? <clears throat> So uh, I kind of like to think of it as um, uh, treating your bare metal as containers. So if you try and find a, 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 a definition of immutable infrastructure, and there's not really a, a single uh, definition uh, that you can find, uh, but we do know that uh, the first reference I've been able to find was by Chad Fowler who was working at a German company back in those days, I guess. Uh, and he explained in that article without actually calling it immutable infrastructure, if I recall co correctly, uh, a way of uh, you know, provisioning the systems uh, within that company uh, like they were containers. So um, immutable of infrastructure is basically uh, trying to use uh, bare metal as containers. So if, if we compare the, the definition from the previous slide with uh, some of the, the, 
the definitions or, or things that we read uh, about Docker, uh, like yeah, Docker containers are immutable, um, actually have this image and um, uh, basically you, you, you cannot change that and uh, you can instantiate that and then do stuff with it. Uh, so um, just going along uh, uh, pretty quick here, but uh, uh, I don't think I need to explain uh, the, the, the use case for containers, right? Um, everybody loves containers. Uh, they're easily deployable. Uh, you know, you can hide away all kinds of complexity inside them. Uh, relatively secure, uh, of course, uh, each technology will have its uh, own little uh, security intricacies, but uh, basically uh, using Dockers provides you with another uh, layer of security. Um, uh, things I can do with containers is like hot swapping stuff, so I can deploy uh, applications because of all those uh, aspects that I mentioned before. Uh, you know, you can hot swap uh, containers and replace uh, applications uh, relatively easy. So uh, why don't we do this with the uh, infrastructure that's underneath? Like underneath, uh, you know, the Docker needs to run on a host. So uh, everybody's crazy about the containers, but why don't we do the same thing for what's underneath? So that's basically what we are trying to achieve. Um, uh, we want to have the same benefits uh, using bare metal as we do with uh, things like Docker containers or you know, LXC or Rocket or all those kinds of new technologies that are uh, up and coming. Uh, because, uh, you know, hey. <laughs> because uh, uh, they allow us the same benefits. You know, uh, even with uh, configuration management tools like Ansible, we do have the reproducibility, uh, but we have less verifiability. Uh, you, have, you have less guarantees than doing stuff like in an image, right? If I have an image, I can basically uh, hash it, sign it, and verify it. <laughs> uh, if I have uh, um, a provisioning process, basically, uh, uh, you will have to take a lot of more steps to be able to be repeatable uh, within that deployment process. Uh, um, so be, things like you have to pin all the versions of all your packages. You would probably need to run your own mirrors. Uh, um, if you have a new version of your uh, configuration management tooling, uh, stuff might work a little bit differently. So. Uh, you know, uh, working with images uh, makes it much more verifiable and much more repeatable and et cetera, et cetera. So why do we want that as well? Uh, security is another good reason. Uh, if we would be able to run uh, a system uh, like um, with no state from an image, just like a container, we could run some kind of intrusion detection uh, and as soon as we detect something that seems out of order, uh, we basically just reboot the machine and return to a known good state. So that's a big plus for us. Uh, currently we're in a part of NADAP that does uh, all kinds of things with security system, like physical access control and stuff. So uh, uh, one of the things that really attracted us to this concept is uh, having that security aspect, being able to recycle machines very quickly and effectively to return to a known good state. But also because the images are verifiable, it's easier to actually detect uh, things that are out of order. Uh, so, and, and with the same as with, with the containers, you know, uh, by having this stateless 12 factor principle kind of deployment, uh, it's very easy to do things like auto scaling or even auto remediation because we can detect if something is unhealthy, you basically recycle it. Uh, it also allows us to be able to uh, both scale horizontally or uh, vertically. So have a tiny application on a tiny compute instance uh, or having a big application running on a big bare metal machine with lots of CPU and memory. 
Uh, it also allows us to be more flexible in terms of physical device selection, uh, which has to do with like failure points, right? If I order one big batch of all the same machines with the same batch of hard drives, they'll probably all fail at the same time. Uh, so by being able to use uh, these kinds of mechanisms to easily deploy large farms of you know, hybrid hardware um, gives us a, a bit more uh, flexibility also with controlling the, 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 end, the mean time to failure stuff. So um, another thing that the digital rebar provision enables us to do is uh, yeah, do infrastructure as code like with the content packs is excellent everything's in repositories uh, everything's scripted so uh, it allows us to automate the stuff so uh, it's a little bit more of an investment up front but uh, uh, pays itself uh, uh, return on investments very quickly uh, so as a little bit of provenance, of course, because it's all in a repository, we can see who changed it, uh, what changed, why did it change, how did it actually change, and we kept, can keep things dry. So we can minimize, uh, um, oh, so uh, I'm sorry. Um, we like to keep things dry, of course, um, but as Rob Pike always says, uh, a little copying is better than a little dependency. So. We try to avoid uh, uh, creating these single uh, uh, points of uh, coupling, basically. <clears throat> so um, with that out of the way and hopefully setting the stage a little bit, uh, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about the proof of concept we're currently working on. Uh, so basically we have Alpine Linux, uh, which we chose because it's the, I guess, the most favorite base image for Docker containers as well. It's very lightweight, uh, very small. Uh, and since uh, I like containers and if we use it for containers, why not use it for our bare metals as well? I have this vision of um, having like a very large farm of basically uh, diskless cheap devices <laughs> and spinning up a Ceph cluster on Alpine uh, with everything just in memory. Uh, and if you have enough of them, uh, that will basically be enough to uh, provide you with the high availability and failover and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but if you want to run in memory, of course, you will uh, want to have a very small footprint. Uh, of the OS itself and the file system that's in there because it's all be will all be running in RAM. So that's why I chose Alpine because basically it will run with a footprint of 35 megs. So that's just kernel uh, and the uh, file system. And then I can add on uh, whatever needs to be running in there. So even for very small workloads, you could basically just have a, a big farm of Pi3 compute in nodes I can pixie boot them with Digital Rebar and run them with uh, Alpine and the workload, just like a container. So basically I, I want to have something like Kubernetes, but then for bare metal. So uh, how does this work? Uh, I hopefully I will, I will show this in the demo. Uh, wait, um, let me see. So what we're going to do is I'll just uh, have, a, uh, or I'll, I have a digital rebar provision instance running in VirtualBox. Uh, I've made a Vagrant sandbox setup for that, uh, which I shared, I guess, on the on Slack before. Um, so uh, if you're interested, try and take a look. Try and share the link maybe somewhere. Uh, so I have this setup, which basically just uh, uh, spins up the provision, installs all the community content packs, and just gets you set up with a with a demo server straight up. Because you now if I if I run the 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 if I do Fragrant up, I'll have a, a running the provision instance in five minutes, uh, which I can use to provision machines within within ten minutes. So. Everything is there. So um, I will boot a little uh, VM. Uh, of course, that will pixie boot from Digital Rebar. Uh, so Digital Rebar will provide the uh, the kernel and the, the uh, init RAM for it. 
uh, of course, the, the init RAM will, uh, or the kernel will boot with the init uh, RAMFS and pr perform an uh, initial init. So it's like a two-stage thing, which uh, you see in a lot of netboot uh, images. Uh, so you have this initial init process, uh, which then actually wipes the, the root FS, uh, creates a new clean root uh, file system. Uh, so APKs are like the Alpine packages, right? So it's similar to uh, YUM or apt in Debian or Red Hat. So uh, basically what it does, the root file system actually is just a package in Alpine. So it's just APK add uh, base file system or Alpine base, it's called something like that. So you get a clean file system and on that you can uh, apply an overlay. So basically this is the immutable part. It's not as immutable as I would like, but that's the Im most immutable we can get. So uh, it's, it's an overlay. Uh, it's basically just a big tar file uh, that Alpine will unpack over the empty root FS. So basically I can create a delta. So I have, I have a staging system somewhere where I do the installation of my workload or everything I need to have uh, in order to run my stuff, basically. I put it in a tar file and that becomes an overlay. And the overlay I can just do uh, set up with a digital rebar provision as a file. So DRP, DRP CLI files add, and it will be there. Uh, and I can reference that, so I will show that. So after the root file system is staged and the overlay is applied, uh, then it will go into the actual init. So in Alpine that's OpenRC, uh, and then it will boot the, the final workload. So basically that's it. Enough talk. <clears throat> so let me see if I can uh, show you this. I don't know how much time I've spent already, but I'll try to keep it a bit more short. <laughs> uh, you're, you're doing just fine, Bastion. You have another uh, 10 minutes or so. That's cool. So. This uh, might look familiar. <laughs> so I have DR provision. I think it's still uh, 3.12. So this is uh, on the on the virtual uh, box. This is just a sandbox I've uh, spun up and I've logged into. Um, so not the fancy new uh, GUI yet, uh, which I'm looking forward to. That looked excellent, Rob. So. But uh, for now, I try to stick with the, with the old stuff uh, because I know it works. So, um, so I have nothing here yet. So let me first try and just spin up a little machine. So don't mind the, the naming. It's called NUC because we use Intel NUX in our lab. So I basically called it NUC. So it will spin up Sledgehammer, of course, because I've set Sledgehammer as the default uh, boot env. So it will go into discovery. And if this is done, it should show up here in the list, of course, as we've shown many times. So should be here, right. So what I did is, and I'll try and show you the actual boot environment later, but I created an Alpine netboot boot env. Uh, so let's run that. Uh, of course, because of the runner, it will do that immediately. And if the demo gods are willing, we should see Alpine boot. So this is actually booting into Alpine Linux right now. Uh, don't know if that was really visible. What what it did was uh, actually pulled in the overlay, actually unpack the overlay, and then in the init process, it only starts a little program called Lift. Uh, so Alpine Lift is a little Go program I wrote, uh, which basically replaces Cloud Init um, because Cloud Init does not work on Alpine and just hacking up something in Go was quicker for me than uh, doing a whole bunch of pull requests to get Cloudinit working on Alpine. So 
basically I created my own uh, cloud and it's uh, clone uh, for Alpine Linux and that's what you see here on the screen uh, that's actually the the, the cloud and it's stuff uh, so it should have booted a, a, a pretty lean empty Alpine Linux system so let's see if we can log into that. So let me first check if I have an old key in there still. No, it's not there. Otherwise we'll, we won't be able to log in. So here is a Provision Alpine Linux machine. So if you look here, it's pretty pretty empty so it's some kernel processes but not a lot and you might recognize this uh, lift even installs the runner so we have lift off from digital rebar so my alpine instance actually managed from digital rebar and if we look at the baseline so i this is a four gig little four gig VM and we're in the baseline right now of 180 megs. So this is a bit bigger than, uh, than um, my initial setup. Uh, but I feel, still think that's pretty okay. 180 uh, megs that's process and that's actually the entire root file system as well. Uh, so let me see if it actually mounted a scratch disk. So I have an option in Lyft to uh, actually provide it with a, a hard disk if you want. And then it will use the disk as an ephemeral scratch disk and basically just mounting VAR uh, on that disk. Uh, which of course is nice if you have things like Docker. Uh, if you do a Docker pool, then all your Farlib Docker will be on an ephemeral disk and not running out of the memory. So that's a little optimization uh, we did. So this is not entirely, uh, that might, this might actually be a bit underwhelming for you guys, I guess, uh, but it took a bit of work uh, and fiddling to get this to work. So, but the, the really nice thing actually is um, with the profiles, because what I actually did was create an Nginx profile and if I assign that to the machine, just let me quickly show that profile to you. Uh, so where are my profiles? My Nginx profile basically uh, points me to another uh, Alpine data file. So Alpine data is actually the alternative for, uh, for the user data that Cloud Init uses. So this will actually be picked up by the, the Alpine Lift tool I wrote. So um, I now will show you that as well. And it actually takes an overlay that already has an Nginx uh, server pre-installed and everything in there. So, so if I, so I never figured this quite out, but is there a way to actually reboot the machine from uh, within the bulk actions? No, it isn't, right? It's only with uh, if you have the the yeah. So the re there are two paths for, for reboot. There's inband path for reboot, where if you change the boot environment, then it will create a a reboot. There's also a um, there's a stage and task that does it, I think, in band as well with the OS. And then the other mechanism is through the IPMI plugin, which would interact with the BMC to implement the IPMI power control functions. And that yeah. would be a plugin path, which is out of or management in mm -hmm. band, I guess. Yeah. Some people call it out of band uh, control, even though it's still a network path. Uh, so those are the two primary paths. Uh, we can talk a little bit more about the reboot path internally um, as a follow-up if you want. Yeah, that, that, that's okay. That's, uh, that's uh, enough pointers for me. So I, I'll figure that out with what you just told me. So actually the IPMI way was uh, the only way I uh, actually thought of. So let me do that uh, by uh, just doing the three finger salute right now. <laughs> 
and uh, let's reboot uh, the machine with with the nginx profile so basically the the boot process of the the host will look very similar so it's it's loading the the kernel on the init ram it will take the nginx overlay uh, which just came in don't know if you saw it but now lift will do things like uh, configuring ssh and you know inserting keys and all that kind of stuff and setting a message of the day so now i will need to because i have a new key of course And if we log in, you will see that we actually have another message of the day. And if everything is correct, we should have an Nginx and it's there. So basically all I did was just add a profile and by doing that, I took uh, another image and deployed it. So let's see what it's actually serving on that machine. Ah, magic, magic happened. That's really nice. So, <laughs> and you know, uh, pretty same. Uh, so the runner is not in there yet, um, but the same way I could just spin up a Docker host. Um, so it won't allow me to do multiple profiles at this point. So I will remove the Nginx. And if I basically reboot the machine, uh, why isn't it rebooting? Uh, okay. So have you, um, have you looked at KXAC? Uh, yeah, actually I did because I, I thought that was really, really interesting. Uh, yeah, that's, that would be an interesting pattern here where you want to repurpose a machine without the reboot cycle. Yeah. Still, still trying to get it around in my head on how that would be like with the immutable stuff. Like, um, you know, I want to pull in something that's really isolated and run that, but uh, KX sec, um, yeah, would be a, a nice way of doing that. Exactly. So lift actually leverages, uh, the Alpine setup scripts that are actually bundled and included within Alpine itself. So actually it's done right now. So let's see on the machine what we have. Yeah, Docker, yeah, baby. So adjusted the, the message of the day. Let's see. Uh, oh. So Docker's on here. So actually, I uh, had Lyft spin up a container already. Uh, that's that's cache. So it might be on, yeah. So, and it's... Uh, Evan has a uh, little Docker demo, but it's running on the, the instance right now. So, and still, I think the, the footprint is pretty okay. So, we still have the, the scratch disk. So, all the, the Docker stuff is actually running on the ephemeral disk right now. And so, that's 475 megs which is still pretty reasonable, I guess. So I'm, I think I'm running out of time a little bit, but um, I can very quickly show you the net boots. So um, when I was trying to get this stuff figured out, I actually asked on Slack and Rob, you pointed out to me, take a look at the CoreOS stuff and that really helped me out. So. Um, basically that's been the, the starting point, like cloning the core S stuff and adjusting all that for doing Alpine. Uh, so this should all look familiar, right? So uh, basically what we're doing is, uh, running it from the, oh, that's strange. Oh, I'm looking at Debian. Sorry. 
got the wrong one. Should have had this one. Yeah. So it's running from the, the default Netboot uh, tarball. So I'm running a plain uh, vanilla kernel and init RAM. Um, basically what I uh, do is uh, tell it where the, the repository is. So let me see how I can move this because I have the, the, all the webcam pictures uh, still on, on my screen. So um, we set the Alpine repository and we actually point it to the overlay here. So uh, as you probably can see, this is just in the, uh, in the files section of DR provision. So I'm pointed to the, the files. So this actually is the mechanism that allows me to put in the, tell uh, which overlay I want uh, within the profile. So it's basically just setting the name for the template uh, or the name of the overlay uh, in the parameter in the profile. And then the Alpine data URL is actually uh, picked up by the, the lift tool I wrote, uh, which has the, the, the user data for uh, provisioning the machine. So uh, there again, I borrowed uh, a template you already had for selecting, uh, what was it? Uh, actually, yeah, you have this mechanism somewhere else as well. So this allows me to select a certain template. So I can just specify template name in the profile and just in the template section, I can actually template, uh, template an Alpine data. So that was Alpine config. And I can set stuff like host name. I can configure my network. I can configure SSHD and a very special section dedicated for DR provision. So Lyft uh, actually pulls the DRP CLI binary from DR provision, installs it and starts it and gives it the machine UID so it can call back uh, with caller identification basically. So, and this is a little thing I added just to show that uh, you could uh, actually wipe the ephemeral disk if you would like. So basically just uh, deletes the disk. And you could do this for every profile you would like. So uh, as I showed before the overlays, they're actually here. So I have one actually for KVM right now. I have one for Nginx. And this is actually the, the base overlay. Uh, one for Docker as well. And of course, creating these overlays, uh, I have separate repositories for that using uh, Docker images for it. So it's all automated. So uh, you provide it with a little script so you can script whatever you want to do and it will produce an overlay that you can just do. Uh, actually, I did a make install that actually just use DPR, uh, DRP CLI to add it to the files automatically and stuff. So I can show you a lot more, but basically it comes down to this. So this is, this to, is awesome, Bastian. Uh, yeah. Okay, I can go on a little bit more, but I guess it would be uh, too long. So if I can, we're going to we're going to wrest control from you here now. No, what you've done is absolutely amazing. It's awesome. I love to see the work you're doing here. And um, Bastian, thank you very much for all the hard work you put into it. I know you put a lot of energy and effort into it. Uh, from the community, do we have any questions for Bastian on the work he's done here? Uh, what's going on here, or do we have any? Thumbs up for more from Bastian if you want to deeper dive into this in a later meetup. And we'd be happy to um, force him to stay up late and come back. I mean, mm -hmm. ask him to stay up late and come back. Mm -hmm. Most of you are on mute. I'm not sure if Rob has you locked out on, on mute. Rob? Yeah, I muted, I muted a lot of people. So if you wanted to fess up now, you'll probably have to unmute yourself. Uh, oh, let me see. There's chat questions too. Any chat questions? Pretty cool. We one one while you look at that. We um, it looked to us, Sebastian, like if you just turned on the KXEC OK global parameter, 
you might get K exec behavior. For free. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Fingers Maybe. crossed. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. um, so what that would allow you to do in your current setup is you could hop back and forth between Sledgehammer without rebooting the box, between Sledgehammer and your image. Yeah. Yeah. Right, which would, which could, which is another way to give you a uh, reboot. You could K exec to Sledgehammer would give you basically a reboot, and then K exec back to Alpine, um, and that would clean give you a an environment swap. Yeah. Yeah. This is amazing. so. So, yeah. Yeah. so everything I I have here actually I put into a content pack. So I hopefully I will be able to release it somewhere so other people can use it and uh, work on it uh, as well. Uh, you can do a pull request against Contrib if you want. We have we have two places. There's community content where we sort of maintain everything that's stable, but there's a there's another folder in that repo in the provision content called Contrib, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and and you could actually put put the into that. Um, content pack if you want or you could just uh, do a new content pack in the community in the digital rebar provision if you want yeah, this is one of the things that I wanted to work on is getting we've got feedback Rob can you mute rod I think sure rod is muted there we go uh, so one of the the things we'd like no nope, that didn't do it All right, how about now? Uh, sorry about that. I was uh, muted. I was muted on my end. Okay. No Good. echo. Awesome. <laughs> One of the things we'd like to do is, is get a, a community contrib sort of program going so um, larger uh, projects and work like this can be more easily contributed back in. So that's on the roadmap to do. But as Rob suggested for now, if you wanted to go to the uh, digital rebar provision dash content uh, repo and then the contrib directory and just do a PR against that contrib directory, create a subdirectory in there for yourself based on your, your um, project name. And we'll, we'll go from there and start taking a look at it and pull your stuff in. It's really cool stuff. Um, let's go ahead and shift over real quick and use the last bit of the time. Uh, Greg is going to give us an overview of some of the changes in content catalog. He's been feverishly working on some cleanup and some changes and some dynamic uh, generation of the content based on backend catalog items and combining content and plugins. We've talked a little bit about it in the last couple of uh, meetups, but we've, I think we've reached a, a stable point with it. Um, and so we'll hand over the baton to Rob and, and Greg to go from here. Okay. Uh, let's go there again. Uh, that one. So not as anywhere near as polished as Boston, but here we go. Um, <laughs> we've been uh, reworking some of the uh, content catalog stuff. Rob kind of showed some of it last week. Um, I'll show you a little bit more of the nuts and bolts behind it. Um, some of you may have noticed that there is a repo.racken.io site now, and we're using that as a storage for all of our content. Uh, between plugins and uh, content packages, we're building up a JSON file that represents those pieces and we're kind of building them automatically. So that way you can programmatically pull them down. The UX is starting to incorporate that as a way to figure out what's the current state of things, how you go about getting them and where you get them from. So like, um, as you can see, this is our um, content catalog and it's in the shape of a content package. So we're using the content package as the form factor for it. So you'll see it has all the normal content package metadata filled in to indicate it's the catalog. Um, there's a version to it, which this is my local one that I was running against so it doesn't have one but it'll have like V190311, so 2019, March 11th. And the idea is the catalog will kind of move along as we do tip builds and stuff like that. So it's kind of always updated 
Uh, and then it also maintains the history. The catalog, when it's built, contains links to stable and um, dip. At the moment, the catalog is built as shortcuts. as shortcuts, and those will move as the content moves. And so um, I'll show you kind of what it looks like from the UI's perspective, um, realizing it's all kind of JSON rendered information. So this is the new um, content viewer. And so we're still finishing the last bits of it. But the idea is that um, each entry now will come from the catalog. The catalog will have a version that will report it. It's still filterable, so you can select it eventually. <laughs> We're finishing that part too. It'll give you what it's installed, it's information. You'll actually be able to find all the elements. Uh, right now, this is like everything we've had forever. Uh, the catalog will probably be reduced to have like three versions back. This is mostly for testing right now so that I can make sure I have all that right. So you'll get a list of all of them and then tip where tip is the kind of moving forward. And as you update the catalog, tip will move forward as well. It'll have the same out of, um, if you're installed and available, all that math can be driven from the catalog. Okay. Um, you'll get your licensing information. You'll even get links to things like uh, docs as well as um, the, uh, repo to actually download them. So for example, um, this column will one day have a link to the actual source. You could directly download it instead of directly injecting it into DRP if you wanted to. Um, let's see. All that's mapped through a JSON system. So for example, if I go look at ITMI, for example, um, I'll have, have in the catalog, I'll have an entry, for example, for IPMI stable, and it'll be indexed by IPMI stable, but you'll actually see the actual version. You'll actually get the link to where you can go to get that binary. Um, and then the checksums for both the, uh, in our case, the Mac version and the Linux version running for AMD 64. And then you'll also get information like, is this a hot fix or is this a tip? So that if you know you need to move up, apparently I may have a bug in the yeah, hotfix no code. <laughs> um, Surprise that doesn't work through. But and then for example, tip has the same thing. You can find out the exact version for tip, the exact source location, all the checksums. So one of the reasons why that's really important operationally is that way if you have a script that you want to install the stable uh, content, you can automate give me the stable content out of this JSON file and you will always get the stable or always get the tip. And so you can create an uh, install script that is reliably installing stable, uh, even as stable, stable moves over time. Yeah. So you're not hard coding a version number. The other thing to realize is that um, the content, the catalog has both plugins. So I was kind of showing you a public plugin, but it's also got the content packs. So in this case, you can see the content pack. Notice the checksum is for any, any indicating that it can be used anywhere. It's got the same source, so you can download it, and the same tracking tip, hot fix, as well as it pulls in some of the metadata so that you can uh, understand what it's used for and where its docs are and things like that. Additionally, um, DRP itself is now in the catalog. So for example, DRP stable, is this actual version downloadable as this zip file because the zip file contains all the architectures we support. It's under any any with the zip file and then you get the same documentation where those things are. The idea is that you can find out whether or not your DRP is out of date this way as well and reference it. The next step for this is that as part of our multi node manager capabilities it will take this as input and allow you to define controls for keeping all your endpoints at the right version, doing rolling updates, automated updates, figuring out what's out of date or not. The multi uh, node manager, multi endpoint manager um, will also give you the ability to take multiple catalogs. 
So the idea is that this catalog is just basically a content pack and you're creating catalog items. This allows you to add multiple catalogs into the system to do things like I have my own content packs, I have my own plugins, and I want to version and control them in conjunction with the community and the rack and provided content so I can create an overarching version set that lets me do rolling upgrades, updates of not just community and racking content, but also customer generated content using the same managed and flow and control system. So that's where this is heading. The first pass of it will be just in managing the local endpoint itself through the catalog and uh, importing the catalog that way. So that's kind of the quick overview of where it's happening. And so um, the and like I said, the content pack can be pulled um, directly from rack and And so then you'll get, you'll get the content pack directly. And that, that way you can always get the latest content pack directly from the system, from our storage area. But it's compressed, so you need the dash dash compress play. Yeah, curl needs the compressed. If you're using like um, a normal API library or stuff like that, it automatically recognizes it. So, for example, in the Go code that we use to pull this stuff internally, it just does an HTTP get, and because all the headers are marked as compressed, it automatically does it. Curl requires you to uh, explicitly put it because it's letting you make a choice between whether you want it to store it compressed or not. So that's why that's happening now. But okay. part, part of the benefit here is that with this file, uh, you can do a single line command to upload a plugin or upload content as part of the build process. That's so right. like we're, try, we're, we're doing some things that are gonna make the quick start um, faster and easier also, um, yeah. and be able to get people a little bit further down the, down the road, even in the quick start with some content, like the task library. Um, You'll be able, to, you can already do today Yes. Uh, to the providers. Uh, oh, I don't have the I don't have the catalog loaded into DRP, <laughs> so it, it's not fighting it. But the idea is that you'll be able to do that, right? So, anyway, that's the gist of what's coming and available and seem to be. In a code uh, repository near you. All right, I'll kick it back to Shane. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate it. Uh, I know the catalog is going to be really useful for helping with infrastructure's code and being able to grab uh, either stable tip or a specified version of given content. And I know there's some interesting use cases going forward with it. Uh, anyone in the community have any thoughts or feedback on that? Uh, any questions, etc. Once, twice, three times. All right, we'll move on to Ansible use case feedback. So the last uh, two meetups, we've been sort of discussing a little bit on Ansible, uh, Ansible groups and roles, uh, playbooks, integration, and it sparked a fairly decent conversation uh, with community in general. So there was some interest in continuing forward on those discussions. I don't have any specific uh, points that I wanted to carry forward on this other than to open the floor up for discussions on either your current experiences with how you're using Ansible or any of the continued conversations from uh, the previous meetups. Leave it wide open from there. Um, this is Greg. I've seen um, three-ish kind of patterns starting to emerge in how Ansible is used. Uh, we've seen a couple in the community and we've seen a couple with our customers. Um, and so in some regards, part of it's, as we think about Ansible, we need to think about trying to address those three and however many others show up. One of them is I want to run an Ansible role locally. So you're used to Chef Solo, it's conceptually kind of like that where I just want a task that's going to pull an Ansible role locally, run Ansible locally against it, and I'm done. So I'm using it as kind of like 
fancy scripting, right? Then there's, I don't like tower, but I want a multi-node inventory that I'm going to run things against. Think of this as kind of like our original use case for our Ansible stuff of poop spray, right? Where we had a, we had a kind of a, our own inventory Perl script and we kind of stuffed some profiles magically in place and that generated an Ansible inventory that we could dump to Ansible that would then do a multi-node operation, kind of external to DRP, but DRP provided the inventory content. Okay, so that's a second use case. And then the third use case that I've kind of seen, and this has come more from a customer, or a customer, where they're driving tower. And so we have the tower plugin where you kind of can register the system with tower, and then tower is going to manage the Ansible run, but we need a way to invoke it to say, hey, we're at this point, start it. And then tower, go do your job, manage Ansible, and let us know when it's done, right? And so those are kind of the three high level use cases I've seen. Um, and right now we, we have ways for doing all of them, though I think we could improve every single one of them. Um, but that's kind of the three cases I've seen for people to think about. Oh, and then <laughs> kind of from the community, there's a fourth case, which is kind of a different path and why I don't necessarily, I didn't mention it, is it's more of how do I deploy DRP with Ansible? Um, and so that's a valid use case for management as well. Um, Currently, our path for Rackin and what we're kind of building towards is the endpoint manager, mostly because we believe there's some synchronization and control and visibility and stuff that we want to do beyond just Ansible with multi node management. And so that's why we're heading there. Um, Ansible is still a good way to potentially deploy us uh, with DRP. So uh, that's not a bad discussion point either. Though in general, our previous discussions were built and focused on how do I use Ansible in configuring a node, either post-installation or during installation. And, and last week we had talked about the challenge of getting coercing profiles into groups. Yeah, and that's in the hierarchy. And that's our that's the second that's the second use case I described. And so, can that be done better and more? And so maybe, and that's a thought area to think about too. Flat, I think flat's doable. Hierarchies, the hierarchy problem got tricky. I don't know, we need a, we need a yeah. person who wants to do it. Yeah, because our profiles aren't exactly hierarchical in an assignment, right? We don't do profiles and profiles and profiles for lots of reasons. <laughs> um, you could fake, you could, no, well, you could fake it as a Python generator. I mean, the current, the, the coop spray stuff that we did that haven't been maintaining um, was really just, you know, parameters, hacking stuff together, and parameters in the Python code had to get smarter. I don't have a problem making the Python code. Well, and one of the questions then become, is there a different path to take where we define some templatized inventory file that gets referenced and built as part of a oh. content package you build, right? Those are, um, oh, cool. Uh, that's neat. Somebody just put in the, to chat a, uh, another round of, uh, um, rebar, um, Ansible stuff. So that's cool. Thank you. Thank you, Bastion. Um, so anyway, those are thoughts. I, I don't want to, monopolize it because I think there's lots to talk about, but um, For Ansible or just in general? Sorry, I'm reading the, so yeah, the, so he was asking about importing configuration options from a flat file. Um, which option? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of the questions that always comes back. So part of the endpoint management stuff manager stuff that I'm working on allows you to do content packages as well as the preferences, basic op options, as well as global parameters and stuff like that. 
um, outside of the content pack so that you can actually manage the other components and parts of the system that aren't settable through content packs. So we're working on a way to handle that. Um, for example, the, the version set stuff that's coming for Endpoint Manager lets you also manage things like files and ISOs and um, plugins, content packages, DRP uh, version itself, as well as preferences, global profile values. I think that's it. There's a lot coming. This release has gotten a little long in the tooth, so it has a lot of stuff. But the point is all of that stuff can then be programmatically maintained in version um, outside of a content pack. Including, including preferences, right? Preferences yeah. will trip set on that too. Do that. The idea is that, yeah, some of the things just aren't easy to do in a content pack due to the read write nature of them. And so, oh, and plugins. You'll be able to create plugins through the endpoint manager. Because plugins are one of these interesting objects that you want to be. Uh, read only, but not really because you want to get the status and other information from it. So it's this weird hybrid object in our system. Sometimes like machine, people want to think about machines that way too. Um, but so with the endpoint manager, you can make sure that a plugin is created with a certain set of parameters, but still have the ability to collect the uh, read write data that's coming back on it from plugins. So, you know, so Depending on this, this would be a good thing. We can put this on a, onto the next meeting as a topic. There's there's a whole bunch of ways to bring bring data in. Yeah, it'd be interesting to hear what you're actually what you're worried about for the. I'm, I'm having I'm having rocks flashbacks. Yeah, exactly. Where rocks rocks is about. Yeah. Gentlemen. Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt, but we're over the top of the hour here. And um, we would absolutely love to continue discussions along these veins. Please reach back to us if you have specific questions or topics you'd like to see us uh, broach in community meetup. Uh, next uh, meetup in two weeks on the 26th, uh, we will have Benjamin Runnels doing some Kubernetes crib demonstrations, we hope, for us. Um, so we have another community member stepping up to show us some interesting work they've been doing with digital rebar provision. Uh, looking forward to seeing all of you then. Until then, please feel free to drop in on the community chat channel, say hello, fire your questions off, or provide any feedback or thoughts or interest in future topics or meetups. If any of you are working on interesting projects that you would like to highlight in community meetup, we'd love to have you on as a guest as well. So reach out to me uh, on Slack. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much, everyone. That is Digital Rebar Provision Meetup number 35. Bye all. Thanks.